Why are Pac-Man's ghosts so brilliant? In 1979, a young designer named Toro Iwatani sat down with a team of nine people to start making something. The 24-year-old noticed that young women were not as heavily involved in the arcade boom that was sweeping his country. So he modified the Japanese character for mouth, painted it yellow, and Puckman was born into this world. A year later, Midway picked up the game and changed Puck to Pac in order to avoid vandalism in the most obvious way possible. Pac-Man became an instant global phenomenon. It's hard for us to see this in hindsight, but it was it wasn't just a video game moment, it was a pop culture moment. I can't stress how big Pac-Man was at the time. Arcades were a new phenomenon, so something that generated over $2 billion one quarter at a time was completely unheard of. Pac-Man was in many ways the title that allowed video uh, games to enter the public consciousness. Yeah. All this success led me to ask, what made Pac-Man such an amazing game and ultimately so popular? I don't think it was because of our yellow hero. I think it had everything to do with our four ghosts. So let's dive in and take a look at what makes them so brilliant. Now before we go any further, I want to give a big shout out to Jamie Pittman's Pac-Man dossier, which heavily influenced this episode and is an amazing resource for anyone who wants to dive deeper into the mechanics and Pac-Man and like how the whole thing works. It's really exhaustive. There's a link to it in the description that you should absolutely check out. All right, so what better way to understand Pac-Man than to be Pac-Man himself, which is why we're here. Pac-Man is super simple. I'm sure all of you have played it, but in case you haven't, you're this guy or gal, and you gotta eat all of these before these jerks eat you first. And these ghosts are the stars of the show. They're each uniquely designed to create different types of fear in our intrepid hero. The important thing is that the ghosts are always thinking one step ahead. And even more importantly, Pac-Man is not always the target. Now you may not know this, but every ghost has a different name, Blinky, Pinky, Inky, and Clyde. Hey Clyde. But since Pac-Man is a Japanese game, the ghost names were represented by Japanese characters, naturally, and those characters reflected a different part of each ghost's personality. So, let's meet our ghosts. This is Blinky. In Japanese, his name means shadow, and he knows you really well. Blinky's programming tells it to find your exact location and zero in like a shark. Let's say I'm in the bottom left corner, just chilling. He's coming straight for me. And if I'm in the bottom right corner, he's still coming straight for me. Okay, easy enough. But let's meet Pinky, whose name translates to ambusher. Pinky fancies itself to be a bit of a soothsayer and its programming tells it to move where it thinks I'm going to be. Four tiles ahead to be exact. Our third ghost is named Inky, but his Japanese name translates to fickle, moody, or uneven temper. Clearly Inky is on Twitter. Inky's behavior is the most complicated of all the ghosts. Inky basically works together with its buddy Blinky. Inky picks a spot in front of the direction where Pac-Man is moving, but that spot is also tied to Blinky's movement as well. Essentially, this means that Inky will be far away from Pac-Man when Blinky is far away from Pac-Man. But as Blinky starts to close in, you'll find Inky in hot pursuit. Think of them like Schmidt and Jenko from 21 Jump Street or the two raptors from Jurassic Park. Clever girl. All right, last ghost. Hey, Clyde. Clyde's name means feigning ignorance or the one who lags behind. Sorry, buddy. Clyde is the least dangerous. I mean, he's named Clyde. Anyway, I don't want to go into too much detail, but basically Clyde attacks and then changes its mind. Clyde sort of has commitment problems. So as you can see, much like ants, the individual ghosts don't seem so smart or effective, but collectively, they can make this seem like this. But a lot of lions can really hunt. Wisely, Iwatani didn't want players to be chased the entire time, at least not initially. He felt it would be too stressful for Pac-Man to be continually surrounded and hunted down. So the ghosts, they come in waves. They either chase you or they scatter to their respective corners like the cowards they are. In the first level, for example, it works like this. Scatter for seven seconds, then chase for 20 seconds. Scatter for seven seconds, then chase for 20 seconds. Scatter for five seconds, then chase for 20 seconds. Scatter Scatter for five seconds, then switch to chase mode permanently. Unless you're a pro player, you're probably not counting the seconds between when you're being chased and when the ghosts are scattering. But you probably feel that alternating sense of safety and terror even if you couldn't explain exactly why. Because every game of Pac-Man is different, but that back and forth dynamic feels about the same from game to game. Again, this is intentional, and Iwatani wanted to create a particular emotional response in players. And of course, when things get too intense, you can grab a power pellet 
and the hunter becomes the hunted. You regain a momentary sense of control. The overall feel of what Pac-Man is is called dramatic tension. Actor Laurence Olivier quipped that the purpose of drama is to exercise and possibly exhaust human emotions, and Pac-Man is, if anything, exhausting, right? Dramatic tension starts with an inciting incident, then rising action, then a reversal, then more rising action and another reversal, and this process repeats until there's victory or death. But without the precise fine-tuning of the ghosts, there's none of that. Look, it's not about becoming an all-star Pac-Man player, though if you want to, you better understand every second of ghost behavior. But lifting the hood makes us appreciate the process even more and shows us how beautiful game design can be. Furthermore, understanding the how gives us a lens into something a bit deeper. Pac-Man is ultimately about illusion of control. The reason we're chased by ghosts is that there's something from beyond that we can only pretend to have power over. Maybe you think that this is an overreach, that I'm reading too much into the game. Game. But if games are an art form, and Pac-Man is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, then we have to allow for these types of interpretations and the possibility that games can speak to us through metaphor. So what do you think? Are the ghosts in Pac-Man the key to its success as a brilliant piece of game design? Let me know in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. Also, a big thanks to Jamie Pittman, whose Pac-Man dossier is invaluable, and also to Sean Williams, whose amazing ghost behavior assets we used in the episode. Link Links to both of these guys are in the description. I'll see you next week. Last week, we talked about why it's important to play as gay characters. Let's see what you had to say. The Emperor Gokasa says that there's not a need for gay representation in games because games in and of themselves allow us to sort of live through these other characters. So it doesn't matter who you are in real life, ultimately you're embodying some other person um, that's on screen. This goes back to an older episode that Mike over at Idea Channel kind of wrestled with this big open question about whether you're being or controlling an avatar, right? So whether or not the avatar is a reflection of you in real life, your thoughts, traits, etc., or are you living vicariously through this other person that you see on screen? So first of all, that's like an open philosophical question about what our relationship to games are, but I would ask you to take one step backwards. Um, while we might disagree philosophically, I think the reality is that games are part of the life that we live in, and in that life, if, as a part of that social system, there are people who don't have full equality under the law. In the United States, for example, gay people cannot get married in every single state. So that's something that's going before the Supreme Court. Hopefully they'll rule on the side of equality. Nonetheless, the reason why it's important to have gay representation in games is because of that symbol that means something. It means something to uh, means something to us. It means something to the world of games. So I understand your desire to want to sort of uh, parse this in philosophical terms, but you can't divorce that from the social reality that we live in, which doesn't treat gays as equally as people who are straight. So yeah, that's where I'm coming from. Lucian Clark makes an excellent point that while Bioware does a lot of amazing things for the LGBT community, a lot of times those characters are misfits or outcasts or sort of fall on the negative side of the spectrum. Um, you see this a lot. This is a common problem. This happens a lot with African Americans, for example, on screen, um, where they're expected to be a certain type of person because they are black. Um, this is, so I understand that Bioware is still wrestling with those sorts of things. Yeah, so they've clearly made a lot of progress, but there's still a long way to go. Thank you for pointing that out. Suichi001 says that it's wrong for us to presume that Master Chief and Gordon Freeman are straight. So I saw that comment, and then I went and read my script. I was like, I couldn't remember where I talked about that. And then I went back and watched the episode and saw that the assets that we pulled were Master Chief and Lara Croft and Solid Snake and Gordon Freeman when I was talking about straight characters. Um, so really sorry about that. It shows how um, even implicit biases can, even when you're conscious of them, can still be very implicit and go right over us. So that's why it's important that commenters like you call us out and stuff like this. Big apologies, but thank you for, for saying that. Draconon doesn't have an issue with representation, but more as a problem with romance, saying that Bioware games um, don't really allow for the depth of romantic relationships. It's kind of like you talk to a character and then you sleep together and then you're kind of a thing or not a thing or whatever. Um, it goes back to some things we talked about. You would really actually really, really like our previous episode on why sex is so bad in video games. So I do think that games are still struggling with creating meaningful romantic encounters between uh, characters um, along the, you know, the entire spectrum. It's something that you know everyone's still trying to do but yeah you feel like Bioware hasn't quite made it there yet that's totally fair <laughs>